All right, welcome everyone. Like, uh, yeah, I'm Theo Goodman. Yeah, I'm going to give you an intro to NIM, uh, which is uh, Mixnet and Selective Credential S uh, System, which gives you network level privacy. I'm just going to go over to my application window. Okay, so privacy, just like these guys. I mean, especially in the current situation of the pandemic. Uh, you know, you can imagine in the back rooms, everybody is laughing like this is the last, you know, someone says something about, you know, citizens' privacy. You could imagine uh, some of the politicians are definitely laughing like this. And uh, I was wondering, I mean, you could see that they're drinking something, but we don't know what. But I was wondering, uh, is, does anyone, is anyone in the audience, uh, do you drink water? Well, I'm going to assume you do. I'm not. I'm not 100% sure they're drinking water here, but I, let's hope that you do drink water because humans drink water, and and that's normal. But unfortunately, what's not normal is privacy by default, network level privacy, and just privacy in general. And it's also not even normal right now uh, for people to wear masks outside during the pandemic, and also for for privacy, but that's not normal right now, unfortunately. But let's hope that you're human if you're watching this, and if you're, you're an alien, that's fine too. So let me uh, get, let me get rid of my mask so you can hear me even better. All right, so here we got you know some of our favorite guys here, and he's telling he said you know internet traffic is observable by global passive adversaries, but I used Grin. Tor and Signal, so I'm I'm covered, man. Don't worry about me. I'm I'm using everything. On-chain metadata can be har harvested and exploited, but he used Grin, and he connected with Tor, and he did some messaging with Signal. Did I use Signal. Traffic analysis of Signal can reveal who's talking to who, when, and where. Basic metadata. So who might be collecting uh, this metadata? Who's interested in this metadata that's being collected? Well, I mean, and I made these slides uh, pre pre pandemic, um, or at least this slide. So who might be who might be interested in it? Well, you know, someone, you know, the uh, a government might be interested in it and give you particular social credits depending on your activity, your internet activity, whatever, wherever you're going, whatever other activity that they can get from the metadata. They don't necessarily have to read your messages. It's sometimes more powerful just to know who, what, when, where about all of your data. And, you know, you know, here we are, well, we're not in Austria today, but, you know, we're in our, in our heart, we're in Austria, maybe. And, uh, you know, telecom and, uh, you know, Deutsche Telekom, so German Telekom and Geheimdienst. I mean, that's, that's, they have a history, you know, with, there was some revelations when Snowden came out and they're, this is, you know, they're definitely working together in some capacity. And, you know, given the current situation, you can imagine that's intensifying and, you know, this is fine. So what do we need? We need tools that can enable us to, to have some privacy. We need a mask for our internet usage that's not just a cosmetic mask maybe you could you could call something like on-chain uh, privacy maybe a, you could say that's a cosmetic mask but we need a mask that can uh it's like a faraday cage essentially we need a mask that can really that can do more than just some cosmetic uh show so you're right we go i go back and just um Go over it again. You know, internet tra traffic is observable, so even Tor can be can be watched by a global private private passive adversary that can watch the whole network. And you know, you have to assume that a lot of the nodes, maybe most of them, are run by by these GPAs. And that means that even if you use Ethereum, Bitcoin, Monero, Grin, Zcash, or whatever Mimblewimble coin, whatever you want. Still, the P2P metadata is going to be 
be exposed. And the same thing for Signal. You know, of course, Signal, the messages are encrypted, but if, if you watch the network, you can still see who, what, where, when, how often, what's going on. All right, and uh, the you know, metadata exposed to the network, all applications, dApps, blockchain. Um, so we need what we need is level layer zero privacy, and that's so that's the mask that we need right now uh, that we're lacking. Uh, there are some problems with uh, Tor and other uh, privacy centric ap applications in general that have existed until now because the incentives, uh, I don't know, I wish I had the quote from Vitaly, but the governance is not that bad. The incentives are not that bad. Well, they are bad because they're not really existing enough. They're very ideologically driven, which is great and often needed to seed some kind of project, but that's not gonna be enough to scale it later. So for example, when Tor uh, has around 7,000 or 8,000 nodes, but it's been the, the growth of the nodes has been pretty flat for years, but the use of Tor has been really going up. So that and that also means a lot of the traffic goes through through a few central relays. So there's the there's not enough incentive to run a node. It doesn't it costs. There's an ideological incentive to run a, node, a Tor node, maybe, if you think that's a good idea. But there's there's it's not a it's not a scalable operation. Also, centralized identity based censorship, you know, Twitter, Facebook, any of the th things that we're used used to do, you know, they can be they can be censored because and they or they could be hit by um, a denial of service attack. Uh, like Signal is very centrally organized. It could be hit by a, a DDoS. Um, and uh, it could be a, a, a quote uh, denial of service attack because of the pandemic and so many people are using it and it's not working anymore suddenly. So it could be a lot of a lot of things going on there. All right, so mixnet. So what what's the what's what's going on? What is going on in a mixnet? So traffic is routed through multiple nodes, unlink the origin and destination. But unlike Tor, there's decoy traffic. So instead of knowing the size of the packet and when it went in and out of the network, you don't know that you don't have that information. Uh, because of the decoy traffic and the timing, playing with the timing, that is going to, the latency that's added to each hop, that's going to help with the timing. And the more users that join, this system can, can, can scale and you, you have greater privacy the more people that join. So it's more of a scalable solution. All right. And here's a graph. I'm not going to go to very technical today. And uh, if anyone does have like really deep technical questions we can we can I can answer the best of my ability and we can I can point you in the right direction where to discuss that but let's, let's just talk about some real basic things we've got a VPN at the bottom well I mean you know in the VPN you basically you know you hand over your your data to someone else the VPN and and you and you hope that they're they're keeping it private and we just I just talked about some of the problems with Tor where you know there's no timing um, the timing is not hidden, and the size of the packet has not changed. So it's it's you know there's some fingerprint that you can make out of it. So here in this graph, trying to show where there are multiple hops, and in the middle there are the dummy packets that come so the, the cover, and there's the timing that's done. So then this is just, just the basic graph just to show you the basics of that. So there's other there are other mixnet projects. Um, and they're cool, and they're tr trying to do similar things. For example, um, Cats and Posts. But Cats and Posts, the problem with it, or uh, one of the main problems, is that you know there's uh, the public key infrastructure, or and and basically who there has there's a central coordinator of who is going to be able to run a node in the system. So it's not a real scalable system in the sense that it's not open to anyone can run. Um, one of the nodes there. So that's not really a scalable solution. Um, then there is, well, then there was, there have been a few that have come out lately, like this, like Mason, this thing came out. An Ethereum mixed natural model. Well, basically, 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, is essentially a copy of Cats and Post. And there's another real um, thing that's wrong here is that, um, or not not great, let's say, here, is that uh, it's a, just the title of it. And the theory of mixed nets are rule them all. Well, you don't want to have an Ethereum mixed net. You don't want to have a Bitcoin mixed net. Just so everyone that's maybe watching getting mixed up, this is not a on-chain mixing service. This is not Wasabi or CoinJoin or or old school uh, mixers or anything like that on chain this is a network level network level so it's not a it's not a mixer and here it says an ethereum mix net to rule them all well you want to have uh multi purposes into your mix net you don't want to have one use because that's gonna if you're already limited to just ethereum you're already limiting the amount of people and so this defeats the purpose of trying to gain gain privacy so what you want to have what we're doing and then we're making a general use mix net that can do cryptocurrency you could put cryptocurrency transactions through it you could put messaging through it you could put a lot of things through it and so through that then we gain a lot more privacy than if we say oh we're just this is a mix net for ethereum for example okay so and here yeah we go see central so some of the existing problems with the mix net some of them i mentioned centralized public key infrastructure um so a central authority is going to have to say yes you know you can run a node or this is who's running the node um there's yeah and then there's the parameters are and the delays um and the amount, amount of cover traffic well yeah you also i mean if i have if i put um if the delay is always the same and the amount of cover traffic is always the same well that doesn't really help anything because it's it's still I didn't I didn't really do anything. So I didn't I didn't add anything to obscure uh the traffic in that case. So you're going to you're going to need to do the delays and the cover traffic in a way that that really obscures what's going on. And uh Cat Post and Mason um don't do that and probably they don't provide any more anonymity than Tor. And like I said, specialized equals less anonymity, you know, if you just do messaging or just do cryptocurrency or just do one type of cryptocurrency, then you're, you know, you're essentially saying we are a privacy solution for a sub niche of a sub niche of a sub niche. And that's, that's not that hard to figure out who's using it, when they're using it, and maybe even what they're using it for. So we need to go on a broader scale in order to really get a crowd. And uh, so here we go, we got cats and Post. Some people say, I've heard of that. That, that It's cool. And uh, so Mason and Cats and Post uh, use Lupix. And the team, the people that made some of the Lupix people are with NIM now. And they're, and Lupix, uh, and, and, and NIM is addressing a lot of the problems or some of the issues with the scalability and the privacy of Lupix. Okay. And uh, if if anyone is watching and wants to um, learn more about, you know, some of the underlying technology of NIM, there was recently, uh, less than a week ago, um, on the Wasabi Research Club number 13, you can check it on YouTube, uh, there was a good talk about Lupix, and um, they went through, and Anna and Harry were on there, and uh, yeah, they, I think that probably a lot of really good questions um, were answered in that in that research club, and uh, I encourage. And also, if you're just interested in privacy in general, it's a pretty cool little project they got going there, Wasabi Research Club, and they go through different things. But I would encourage you to watch that if you want to. So, Lupix, uh, yeah, I would say it's kind of a, it's an underlying technology that uh, we're using. All right, so here we go. Um, some of our solutions. Blockchain. So we're going to use a blockchain for the public key infrastructure instead of a central authority. Blockchain can store the the PKI for MixNet and other data needed for the operations in a decentralized fashion. Uh, credentials, anonymous measurement of network tra traffic and transfer of private data by validators, and they prevent civil and DDoS attacks. NIM tokens reward permissionless mix nodes for mixing traffic and maintaining anonymity, dynamically expanding number of mix nodes and validators to have traffic. 
great, great. I just read that for you. Um, so basically, you can imagine um, if you run a node and you do what you say. So you say, I have this much capacity of mixing. Then you're going to earn, and you and you do that, and you're your good behavior. You're, you behave well on the network. And you're going to earn tokens. So it's it's a it's it's a type of proof of work in the sense that it's proof of mix. So if you're actually doing what you're supposed to do on the network as as a mixed node, then you can um, earn tokens. There will be other ways to earn tokens too. I'm not going to get back to that. But so the, the potential traffic. So this is one of the ways that it's uh, able to scale because the traffic is measured and it, re it results in and it's measured per epoch so that based on the successful sending of traffic through the mixnet. So this is getting into some of the more technical, crazy mathematics stuff, but it's a, it's a way of doing it. In this way, we avoid having to have um, a centralized actor. So the NIM, um, the NIM network is it's permission, the number of tokens uh, index capacity network. So yeah, like I said, it's rewarded to the quality of service. Uh, if nodes um, don't do what they say they're going to do, like they don't, they don't offer, they don't have, the, they don't, aren't doing the quality of the service that they say they're going to do, which would be a capacity, then they're going to get kicked out. And more nodes are added as more capacity is needed. Um, there are fair rewards via a Merkle tree and commits per Sphinx packet. And transaction fees are paid to nodes. And it's a def deflationary emission. So these are all, all common. Some of these are you know, deflationary, it's really common, decentralized. Um, okay, so validators transport NIM tokens into credentials. So the thing is that the NIM, without getting too off track, <laughs> uh, there's two main parts to the NIM system. There's the mixnet, which is mostly what I've talked about, but there's also the select Active disclosure credentials, and um, those are also going to be used. Those are also can be used to, um, you know, to wrap cryptocurrency. That can be used to do any number of things. Okay, so let's see. So I'm at the end, pretty almost, almost getting close to the end of the of the talk part, and maybe someone has questions, or I'm just going to keep talking to fill up the time, but um, I want to give some quick history. So uh, we have been really successful lately as far on the developmental front. So in December, um, the testnet debugging. So we, all, we launched a, the first testnet and, uh, the de and for debugging, and that was launched at the Chaos Communication uh, Convention in Leipzig. That went well. And uh, it was you know just people that were interested there were the first people to take part, and um, we have now you know a, a test net with volunteer nodes and people, individuals, and companies that are interested in doing the test net and trying to integrate with it. So now the big announcement is in my in my uh, in my slide. I can maybe I'm going to make it bigger. Let's see, 96 is the biggest. So now. Oh, uh, I want, we're gonna we are we have a public test net that you can join. So that that's the big announcement. Everyone, everybody, come over and uh, try out our test net. You can get on the mixnet. Um, it's it's running in Rust. It's running very fast. It's running faster than we th thought it could run, and that means that maybe it can do other applications. So it's probably not. We thought that it's probably not suitable. For for things like web browsing and some other, or, or voice over IP or some other things, but probably it could do all that. It probably could watch a movie over it, um, which we thought probably is not possible, but a lot of the, but it's going a lot faster than we thought. But why would I want to even play around with the testnet? Why, why why should I care about that? Well, let's check out what's going on. So Airfoil uh, is, is playing around with the test doing some stuff. Uh, they're running a validator because they believe in the fundamental priorities that NIM is aiming to solve. Um, so you might know the project Airfoil. Um, Electric Coin Company 
uh, believes network privacy is an essential layer for defensive cryptocurrency users. We're happy to participate in the NIM testnet and look forward to the mainnet launch. And also, somebody, I'm not sure who, uh, this person, Jonathan Logan, just randomly dropped a white paper on the internet the other day. And uh, it's quite, quite interesting because it talks about current pandemic and, you know, privacy preserving contact tracer. And this is a real feasible use of, of the mixnet or, and or the selective disclosure credentials um and i th think that is you know really cool it's definitely could use them it's a perfect fit and this is the kind of application that could really really use it so here is the i don't have the link i'm sure we can link to it. we can find it but uh it's on github jonathan github.com slash jonathan logan you should be able to find it um, i have no idea who that is and uh, so how do i join how do you join the testnet you join the test net, uh, nimtech.net, docs, mix net, slash installation. That's the best way. Also, if you just go to this, um, if you just do nimtech.net slash docs, then you're going to get a lot of good um, documentation. Um, do, the, do the slash installation. Uh, also, um, we have a key base that's now open to the public. Uh, the key base is, you know, very much more for tinkers, people that want to experiment um, than something like Telegram. But yeah, please join our key base, nimtech.friends. Uh, please join our Telegram, Nim Project. Oh no, sorry, that's the Twitter, Nim Project. Uh, follow and join our Telegram at Nim Chan. And uh, that's all I've got for the talk for introduction to Nim. Maybe there's some questions. It's very well documented. Yes. Hey, what's up? Hey, this is Harry from NIM. Uh, great job, Theo. So if, if people want further uh, to walk through the node, the mixed node instructions, the how to install and stuff, we could do that after the talk. Um, you know, today's the first day we're kind of opening uh, the mixed nodes to the general public. So when you start the mixed node, uh, you automatically join the mixed net. And also we can put you in a key based channel where you can chat with us if you have any issues, but if people want to do that right after the talk. That'd be great. Um, so yeah, just want to tell people that we have currently cool. about 15 mix nodes, 20 mix nodes, uh, Blockstream, Monero folks, Zcash folks, lots of fo uh, lightning labs, so, some good folks running them. And we'd love to see more, particularly from everyone here. So what, what can I do if I'm, you know, what are some reasons that I might want to, what could I build using uh, our testnet? Uh, well, I mean, the current app that I think um, Amir Taki and others are looking at is trying to build a sort of uh, private Bitcoin uh, wallet. Um, I know Roberto's been um, working on a messaging app. And then I know we also have uh, now because of uh, this post by Jonathan Logan, there's interest in getting a, a privacy enhanced uh, Corona uh, tracking app. And we're also talking to some folks, uh, the Zcash Foundation and uh, academics like uh, George Denisis and other folks about this. So I think there's lots of different apps. The, the instructions are very detailed on how to set up the software. We are still working out a wiki with instructions for the apps, but we have a few demo apps that you can look at and copy, copy code. Um, for example, we have an app that's using Flutter. Um, we have another app that's, you know, so it's, it's easy to, of course, integrate against Rust. Uh, but the main point of the mixnet is that we're set up in a very similar way to Tor. So you just open up a, a daemon on a port and throw TCP IP packets in on the client side. So client side integration is really easy. Uh, server side integration is a little bit more difficult because you have this thing, which if you go to that link that Theo shared, uh, nim, uh, nimtech slash docs, uh, you basically have to set up like the mix not equivalent of a Tor hidden service, a sort of NIM server uh, for your app. And that's we currently call the uh, store and forward provider. And if you could, uh, and that's kind of what you have to customize your back end on so that you might need that, for example, for messaging or doing Bitcoin broadcasts or storing a database 
uh, of uh, randomized uh, Bluetooth signals for a Corona tracking app. These are sort of things we have there. So, okay, and, th and then getting uh, – and also, if anyone joined and wants to ask a question, just uh, press the raise hand or whatever. I'll get – we have time for you. Um, also, um, while you're here, I wanted to ask you, okay, let's say I've got a, – a lot of people want to run nodes because they think – because they – like I said, it's, it's an incentivized network. So what is the future – like how could I benefit from running a node and just – I want want to earn tokens uh, by, by you know mining the mine essentially mining on the on the mixing so what is that going to look like how am i going to what do i need do i need to get like a really big server or what could i you know because like if you want to buy if you want to mine on proof of work then you get you know mining equipment so what do i get to for mix mining what do i need to like beef up to get ready for yeah it? so i think dave is going to release a blog post on this and there's a lot of work in progress describing the details um so those details will all come out unfortunately right now uh if you run help uh well, yeah. if, you, if you can basically if you can run a node uh you get you you for the machine you don't need much hard drive space because what you're doing is you're basically creating these anonymous Sphinx packets and you're sending these packets from one machine uh, to another. And that means that the uh, there's not a huge requirement for hard drive space, but there is a requirement for a decent CPU. We're not talking about GPU, uh, like ASIC mining, but you know, just a good CPU and lots of RAM. And I think the main thing is to have a good internet connection. So try to put it on something with a pretty stable connection because people will be shipping you packets all the time. And the more packets you ship, the more packets you get rewarded. So basically, we have a technique based on verifiable random functions where we basically sample the network uh, fairly using this verifiable random function to prove the sampling. And that sampling basically sends traffic through the network that's anonymous like everyone else's traffic. By the end of each round, that traffic gets revealed. And if you've mixed that traffic correctly, we can use features of the Sphinx packet to show that you've uh, mix it correctly. In particular, you you basically store a nonce in a Merkle tree every time you see a packet. And each Sphinx packet has a nonce for replay protect attack protection. Uh, you can sh prove that you've shuffled these packets, that you've mixed these packets. And that's called mixed mining. And uh, we're looking into reward schemes for mixed mining. We haven't fully worked those out, which is why it doesn't work yet. Uh, but we love, if anyone's interested in this, uh, we'd love to talk to you. Just pop me an email or a message in our Telegram or, or Keybase. And uh, we do look forward to getting, the, I think, the next steps after the MixNet. We'll probably see the reward system testing kicking in over the summertime would be my guess. Okay. What about um, the, uh, the concept of me offering a service uh, for... So basically, the MixNet right now, the where it's it's really the way the way the NIM is being built. It's built for people to build applications on, and then the users of that application will be able to have privacy. Correct? Yeah. So the uh, when you set up a mix node, it is public that you're running that mix node. The IP address and key you put out. Uh, we're working on you know the uh, but basically the users. And the apps running on the MixNet are not public. And there's no knowledge that the mix nodes have over which user is going to which app or even which packet each which user is sending. And thus, this basically makes the services used by each user unlinkable and makes the, um, the mix nodes have no knowledge over what user is doing what. And, and that's, I think, to be honest, that's much stronger than the guarantees given by other anonymous systems and required for many apps that use like application level anonymity, such as, you know, anything that requires um, something like Zcash or a script or any of these sort of blind signature schemes, they all require network level privacy. And that's kind of what the NIM MixNet provides. Right. And so I could, um, and so if I need uh, NIM tokens to go to use the system, I, the app could stake some NIM tokens and then provide it, the users with access. Yeah, so what we're imagining is that the users, they don't, the, maybe the maybe a better way to think about it is the users, in order to prevent Sybil attacks and a DDoS attacks on network, 
users get an anonymous authentication credential, which is essentially a right of access credential, which basically doesn't tell the network anything about the user other than the user has the right to access the network. Um, and I gave a talk at Chaos Computer Congress, uh, Chaos Computer Camp last year about these credentials in detail, if people are interested. But the basic concept is that service providers will have services, ideally that, you know, are supported somehow financially, um, and that they will basically take these credentials and get these credentials on behalf of their users. They can do this either by basically time locking up, uh, you know, finances to prove they have a sort of, not a classical proof of stake, but to prove they have a sort of stake in the system. And then these credentials go to the users and the users the, then use these anonymous credentials to access the system. So we don't imagine a system, I think it's actually these systems don't work, systems like where you essentially expect the user to like buy a token to use the system. We expect most users will continue using Bitcoin or Monero or Zcash. Users are going to mostly keep paying and sending transactions, whatever they pay for. But we do imagine that there'll be some, I would hopefully assume, lucrative anonymous and privacy enhanced services on top of this network and that these services basically will, will purchase credentials or otherwise they can get credentials for free um, for their users. So we're trying to make a really, you know, we're trying to really minimally constrain uh, the economic model that we put on top of them. That being said, you know, we're not going to be, um, we do want people to have an economic model and we do want people to have a sustainable model because we think without some kind of good crypto economics and sustainability, at some point the network will fall apart. So yeah, I was talking about um, how fast, how much faster it's been going since changing to Rust. So what is that, does that, what do you think that changes? I mean, we were joking about watching a movie through the test net. Uh, you know, what does that change? Uh, what's feasible or does, or we just need to, you know, have more users on the test net before we really say that you could do more than we thought with the, with the mix. Yeah. I mean, the weird thing with, with mixed networks is so they, unlike, let's say Tor or an I2P based system like Loki, they are, um, message based, not circuit based. So Tor or VPN or something, they kind of open up a TCP IP circuit and that allows streaming. And that's one of the reasons you can easily stream videos over uh, a mixnet. I'm uh, sorry, no, over over a VPN. Then, you know, you can even to some extent stream videos over Tor because they share that fundamental circuit based streaming. Mixnets, on the other hand, are more private, more anonymous than Tor VPNs, but that is not for free. It comes at a cost. And the cost of the, each packet is anonymized individually. So each packet is routed separately. So that's the fixed packets that are all look the same, that have re-randomizable encryption or sh shipped and mixed between each, each mix node. So what that means is that's going to be very hard uh, to do things like video streaming. Uh, but that being said, there's lots of applications, cryptocurrency, messaging, uh, database-backed applications, uh, which fit a message-based framework really nicely, anything on, for example, ZeroMQ. And that's the sort of apps that we imagine NIM will support. Now, as NIM grows, the nice thing is that the more users you have using the system, the more traffic there is, the more the less dummy traffic you have to, to, to make, and the more anonymous everyone is, so actually, to some extent, the less mixing, the less timing delays you need. And that means that as the system gets more users, it should get uh, actually faster. Mm -hmm. So we do think that as the system scales, it will become easier and faster to use, which is the reverse of lots of other like, you know, it's, it's, you, you don't have that characteristic in lots of other anonymous communication systems. Mm -hmm. All right. Is anyone, if anyone has any other questions about NIM says... Don't you think by running a mixed net node, I'm raising a huge red flag? Uh, Harry, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still on. I mean, I don't think you're running any more of a huge red flag than running a Tor relay. And um, it is, and unlike, you know, unlike Tor, there's not really exit nodes. So if you look at most of the legal actions against Tor, like the terrible raid, um, against uh, Tor servers and, and Munich last year, 
Uh, that raid was because there was tour traffic going to a website that was being monitored. And they said, well, it's all coming from the exit node. Let's hit the exit node up. So the nice thing about the mixnet is once you're in the mixnet, there's not really an exit per se, or at least a identifiable one. Uh, so that that's good, useful, um, unless you make your service a bridge that wider and in which case you can kind of function as an exit node. Um, mixed nodes themselves and Tor relays, the reason why they actually don't have that many takedown requests, uh, and very little actually, is because it's actually been ruled under U.S. law, United States law at least, and I believe it holds up in Europe, that it's legal to run anonymizing software. That's even part of the most latest FinSim judging on blockchain technology. So if you look at that scary FinSim paper where it says, oh, maybe you know we need all this KYC and all this AML, they also say it's legal to create and to run anonymous software. The only point where it becomes illegal is it's clear you're running the software for illegal intent. So that'd be like, oh, I'm running, for example, you know, um, Silk Road. Okay, so Silk Road, you know, they can claim, you can, they can claim, you know, like if I were a law agent that Silk Road is, um, has illegal intent. But with a mixed node, you don't know what service your users are using and you don't know, you're just essentially relaying traffic. So um, you're unless you are running something like Silk Road, in which case you have all of the dangers that entails, um, running a mixed node itself essentially falls under a concept uh, called uh, lack intermediary lack of liability. So it's like, hi, if I'm Google and I link to like a website that's something illegal, it's not my fault as Google. And you can the same legal framework applies to VPNs. It applies to Tor and also applies to mixed nodes. So um, I think from a legal perspective, we're pretty fine. Uh, we do have a lot of lawyers working on this very topic, uh, including a few you guys might know. Everyone from uh, Preston Barron, who's quite big on Twitter and blockchain space, to Ron Kuby, who defends all sorts of stuff, to Ahmed Kapoor, who's a professor at law um, at Boston U, who defended, I think, Barrett Brown and Chelsea. And so we have a lot of lawyers kind of going into this. And so far, it, it, it's, you know, we, we believe that running a mix that is covered by the same legal framework that lets you run a Tor relay or anything else. And you have actually a lot more protection. Uh, because there's very little, it's sort of, you you really don't know, and it can provably not know, whose traffic you're redirecting to what service. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. I just wasn't sure of the lawyer opinion, like, you, but you were. Uh, so, uh, that also, this the guy that asked that in chat says, uh, ha ha, uh, for Tor, my provider already called me and asked me to switch it off. Well, is that running a Tor uh, relay or a Tor exit? Actually, I it's think I don't know. I don't know, but I mean, that's also not legal action. I mean, it's just it you is know. annoying. You could go to another provider. It's annoying. Uh, so what? There are there's... probably jurisdictions uh, where running stuff is illegal, and it is also true that sometimes ISPs, you know, yeah. particularly in my experience in Germany. Uh, really flip out. So they're like, oh, we caught you bit torrenting. We're going to send you a fine. I mean, yeah. the, the, the key is one of the reasons why we're using a sort of largely centralized network is so we're not uh, we're not trapped in a single jurisdiction. So let's go back to the questions. Okay, yeah. And uh, we'll have, we'll have uh, I want to say that the uh, breakout space is breakout.innerspace.chat slash NIM, just N-Y-M, because I think we're getting close to the end, but we had uh, we had a question. Um, how feasible do you think it is to patch NIM to work with B Bitcoin open timestamps for public key for PKI? Uh, I'm not sure. How oh, yeah. So that, you know, I, I have a little paper on open timestamps uh, published with Peter Todd. I think it's uh, open timestamps is a great effort. And yes, we're basically are using some of that design and decentralizing the PKI. And that the, the first version of that stuff should be rolled out in two or three weeks. So yes, we're working on that actively. 